we host uh, nine different thematic sessions this afternoon. And the talk that I'm going to be giving um, is really to many of the themes, uh, particularly regulatory affairs, to healthcare products, drug development and DS, interactions and toxicity, along with uh, drugs, cap, and medicines. <coughs> now, complex alternative medicine in the United States, <coughs> just like in India, is very popular and is believed that of 38% of the population in the United States and 12% Children use some sort of some sort of a complex medicine, and in United States, there are about 34 million, uh, sorry, billion dollars are spent on visiting camp. And in fact, in 1990 and 1997, it was shown that um, the people in United States, United States visited the practitioners more than actually they visited. The Medicare physicians. Now, the CAM practice includes, uh, as you know, including Ayurveda, yoga, and uh, homeopathy, and, and so on. But one of the constituents of uh, the CAM therapy products dietary supplements, which include vitamins, minerals, herbs, and other botanicals. And in the United States alone, about $30 billion per are spent by people trying to get supplements to treat pain and inflammatory conditions. In the U.S., the dietary supplements are not regulated as foods, uh, sorry, regulated as drugs because the FDA is authorized to evaluate the and efficacy of these drugs, except when the dietary supplements give toxicity. If it's unsafe, then the can intervene and prevent the sale of the compounds, particularly what happened with the F. Um, they had to take it out of the market. Now, commonly work, common products include, uh, you know, cat's claw, which is very used in uh, Indian countries, echinacea, gin, marijuana, undergod wine, and this. All these are all compounds um, derived from the products and have been used extensively as uh, anti-inflammatory agents. Now, there are often uh, associated with the CAM therapy, particularly dietary supplements, because of the fact that some of these compounds, because they are crude products, they can directly cause toxicity in or sometimes they are heavily contaminated with pesticides, pesticides or heavy metals. And these are Compounds uh, or herbal medicines that have been used and have been to cause certain types of cancer, stroke, hepatic injury, as uh, some of these compounds, SWOT, for example, interferes with the, um, the conventional drugs because it increases the from oxidases. So, therefore, in states, um, in uh, physicians are becoming aware of a large proportion individuals use some complement and alter medicine medicines and then the physicians are their patients as to what CAM therapy take and also it's become very crucial that patients be informed if they are taking some sort of complement and alter medicine that when they visit a physician they need to inform them they make sure that these herbal products don't interfere with the that they are taking. It's also important that you try to randomize control trials because most of the CAM products are being used from hearing from an individual or going through the website, finding out that someone uses some product and that's very efficacious. Um, so therefore, NIH has started an institute, the National Center for Alternative and Alternative Medicine, and this institute of NIH, National health um, is trying to conduct uh, clinical research to make sure whether these complementary and alternative medicines are safe and if they are, you know, how they should be used and so on and so forth. And for example, clinical trials have shown that 
myeloma was ineffective in reducing the de the development of dementia and alzheimer's disease and same way st john's wort which has been uh, extensively to treat dementia, was found to be not effective after clinical trials but on the other hand a lot of people in chondritin sulfate combination of compounds osteoarthritis and they found that this compound or this combination is effective against osteoarthritis and also this was it was recently published that the red yeast rice lowers the cholesterol and therefore for people who have toxic in taking statins can the red yeast rice. these are randomized controlled trials in humans that have been published in a um, very good peer review journal thereby making some compounds more reliable so if they used by by patients or individuals and that's what and i'm trying to stress that the complement alternative medicines are being um, um that we conduct the randomized control trials and now along with uh, dr ms kari here um we've been directing centers for inflammation autoimmune diseases one of them is uh, funded Institute of Health again for six million. It's one of the eleven. And what we do is we try to test uh, various chemicals for inflammatory properties. And I'll talk to you a little bit about inflammation in, in a couple of minutes. Recently, we received another ten million to further develop recruitment of junior faculty, try to train them in research involving inflammation. To the important research on inflammation as well. So the question therefore is now are we focusing on plant products and if you look at the data you'll realize that almost half of all pharmaceuticals are derived from products including such as morphine digestive mincristine sol which is used for cancer they're all derived from plant products and it's been reported that the world's 25 best selling pharmaceuticals were either natural products or derivatives from natural products and uh, recently science magazine um, published data to show that there are over 250000 plant species on earth and only 6% have been screened for their biological activity and only about 15% have been screened for their pharmaceutical activity so therefore we have huge numbers of plants the uh, for their efficacy against its disorders clinical disorders so therefore I strongly believe in the institute um, that plant products and natural products offer the potential research for drug discovery and i don't need to stress that because as you know um, the traditional ayurvedic medicine has been practiced in india for many centuries now why we are studying inflammation now inflammation is your immune response trying to protect you against various infections such as cancer right? so in more recently has been shown a double edged sword on one hand it's absolutely critical inflammation be there to protect you against infections and against cancer sometimes the immune system haywire and can cause diseases such as autoimmune diseases um in which your system destroys your own organs tissues but the recent study shown that inflammation is the underlying cause of most of the major clinical disorders that include vascular diseases neurodegenerative diseases such as alzheimer just a few years ago there was a paper showing that you know one of the major problems associated with alzheimer's disease is a, is defect in fact cells or immune cells and there are about the autoimmune diseases cancer obesity they all are associated with chronic form of inflammation so there you can imagine of trying to discover drugs that can suppress inflammation it have a, a major act in trying to eradicate and to prevent a lot of clinical disorders in terms of the impact in on healthcare the vascular diseases have an impact of over 258 billion dollars 
cancer, over $200 billion, autoimmune diseases, over $100 billion. Now, focus on autoimmune diseases, there are over 80 AIDS autoimmune diseases that are, that are triggered by your immune system and trying to destroy your own cells or your tissues. And some examples listed are great lupus, myasthenia gravis, arthritis, diabetes, diseases, and, and, and goes on. Now let me introduce you to um, the main theme of the topic, which is the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, or AH. Now, hydrocarbon receptor, HR, is a transcription factor. And it was discovered by the fact that a lot of environmental factors, such as diabetes, or TCDD, or other polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. When they enter cells, they bind the transcription factor, and then this complex translocates to the nucleus. Another protein called AT, and this complex then binds to the um, promoter regions, those genes that express the complex, what I call as dioxide responsive element. So if a gene expresses dioxin or phenobiotic responsive element, then this complex will bind to that and thereby activate that particular gene. And some of the well-characterized genes include the CYP1A1 family, that is the drug metabolizing enzymes, which help detox or try to break down these uh, environmental mutants. But very interestingly, Recently, it has been shown that H receptor is there primarily to regulate cell cycle cell division as well as to regulate response. So, a couple of papers in high impact journals like Nature and showed that the aryl hydrocarbon receptor has endogenous, which can then take the immune functions or can regulate the immune response the generation of regulatory cells and TH17, which is going to be the topic of my talk. Now, in our lab, in our, in our culture, we've, we've been able to show that a lot of plant products can also bind to the H receptor and therefore act as receptor ligands. Okay? And samples that I'll be discussing is resveratrol, is a plant polyphenol found in red grapes and red wine, which you all must have heard about. Uh, Fix C, one of the um, tryptophan antioxidant products, and a lot of these plant indoles. And in fact, the missing agricari in the afternoon will be talking about PC uh, and DIM, which are from the cruciferous vegetables that act as HR ligands. Now, let me focus on resveratrol as one of the HR ligands. Yeah, resveratrol has been to activate the SIRT1 gene and a gene that is involved in the prolonging the life of an individual and it's been shown to extend of yeast which was published in Nature 2003 and this observation was extended to worms, flies and mice and it's believed for that use of resveratrol might prevent the gene and one hypothesis is that the reason why we age because of chronic inflammation Therefore, if we can block inflammation and activation of kappa B pathways, then, you know, can prevent the aging process and therefore increase the longevity as well. So that probably hit the headlines because of its anti-aging properties, but we are trying to focus more on its anti-inflammatory properties. So um, one of the experimental models that I'll be talking about is uh, a mouse model for um, studying the multiple sclerosis with autoimmune disease that causes paralysis, MS. So we use um, a MOG um, peptide into these mice, which is a region that is found in the brain, along with the pertussis toxin. And in a few days, these mice start developing hind leg paralysis, and they suffer from a disease which is very similar to the multiple sclerosis. And we rank the based on the level 
of um, paralysis that is in these points. And um, for some of the data, uh, you can see that after you log, after 10 days or so, these mice start developing the clinical signs of the paralysis, which peaks around 15 and then slows down. But if you treat mice with resveratrol at the same time, you find that there is a significant delay in the onset of paralysis, but also the CV disease is significantly lower, statistically significant. If you give a higher dose, you find that resveratrol is able to significantly increase clinical symptoms associated with the uh, onset of paralysis. Now, if you take section of the um, spinal cord of the brain, that's where the disease is triggered, and that in mice injected with MOG, you get severe inflammation caused by the T lymphocytes and macrophages. But treat the mice with resveratrol, and that there is a dramatic decrease in cellular infiltration in the brain. So the inflammation is kind of blocked. Now, which a lot of research is, uh, in this area. So I just want to, I mean, to give a brief overview. What we can do is that resveratrol acts through multiple pathways. One of the pathways is that there's aptosis in T lymphocytes that are activated. That is, it makes those T lymphocytes commit suicide. And we've shown that it does so by activating two molecules. One is called as FAS and the other is FAS ligand. And activation of FAS ligand pathway to, um, the cell uh, committing by activation of uh, the caspase. So quickly, if you take and culture various concentrations of um, resveratrol, triggers a dose dependent of apoptosis. Um, 4.2% and 2% in vehicle to almost 5%. Use activated cells that are T cells that have been activated. You find they become sensitive, almost 98%, 96% of the cells can be effectively killed by resveratrol. Thereby, that activated T cells are more susceptible to resveratrol induced hepatitis, which is good to say that resveratrol is not really toxic to naive cells, but it's more toxic to T lymphocytes that are activated, for example, in autoimmune diseases. It's the same. Showing activated T cells are more susceptible than naive cells. Again, some of the mechanistic pathways said resveratrol um, seems to trigger uh, induction of fast, fast ligand pathways that triggers induction of hepatitis. Um, we have done studies to show that resveratrol is effects through activation of H receptor, in as much as uh, if you add H receptor antagonist, you can. Heptose from 69.8% to 38%, adding the um, alpha nephthalene, is HR receptor antagonist. We've shown that use HR receptor knockout mice, they are more resistant than wild type mice in terms of their susceptibility. So we've done extensive, so we have done whether the resveratrol can also affect against various autoimmune diseases. And one slide which shows we've been looking at the uh, effect of resveratrol and in bowel disease. There are two forms. One is called ultra colitis and the other is And we, in the mouse model, brain sulfate murine colitis as a model. And as you can see here, in these uh, colitis mice, high levels of syrup A falling with resveratrol, it dramatically decreases the clinical dramatically decrease, and this is a typical sign of uh, colitis where there is shortening of the growth, and resveratrol is able to pretty much purge entirely the toxic effect that is seen in on, on the colon, thereby showing resveratrol um, from colitis. These are histopathological showing you know significant infiltration of uh, dramatic infiltration, but with resveratrol, it seems to almost completely block the inflammation. Um, again, I'm just showing you uh, a few slides in the interest of time. We looked at lupus using 
sustain injection and you find again uh, skin lesions in mice similar to lupus that are almost completely uh, by treatment or exposure to respiratory and these are histopathological studies and also if you look at albumin creatinine ratios in these mice it keeps increasing um, by day 150 there's dramatic increase in ratios and respiratory can completely um, block this um, in the onset kidney damage in these mice. Um, we next looked at uh, the effect of respiratrol on respiratory distress syndrome because we thought this is a really important form of inflammation in which uh, people, in fact, uh, almost people who it's almost 30 to 50 of the people die because of severe inflammation in the lungs and caused by excess inflammation or injury and that results following either Bacterial infections like sepsis, uh, infection of the lungs, surgery, or inhalation of substances. And we looked at the staphylococcal enterotoxin B induced uh, acute lung injury, in which the SCB directly to the MHC activates the T cell receptor to produce various cytokines that causes inflammation, and as a result of which, there is endothelial cell damage as well as epithelial cell damage and major lung injury. And we Following SCB, there's dramatic reduction of vascular leak syndrome. But if you treat the mice with respiratory, we are able to significantly block the um, block this severe infection that is caused by uh, staphylococcal enterotoxin B. Thereby showing respiratory is very potent in its mediating uh, anti-inflammatory properties. Um, again, these are studies showing you know inflammation uh, in the lungs. Significantly blocked um, with uh, or potent with um, of course, free treatment is much more effective. Um, now I quick uh, switch over to the me additional mechanisms, and as you know, it's been shown that the way we behave or the way we um, become susceptible does not only in the way that your genes, but also outside of what, outside the gene, what happens in terms of what are called as epigenetic changes. And these include the DNA methylation or induction of certain RNA and so on and so forth, which indicates therefore that our susceptible to disease by um, the diet, the, stress, uh, the exercise and a lot of other environmental factors. So we wanted to find out whether exposure to uh, or other receptor ligands would cause a significant change. And we were able to show that activation of the H receptor can cause um, hypomethylation of FOXP3 and uh, hypermethylation interleukin 17. And again, interleukin 17 or lymphocytes that produce IL 17 are considered to be. T cells. They are the ones which cause multiple sclerosis. And FOXP3 producing T regulated cells, they suppress inflammation. They suppress the inflammation. Before. We're able to show that uh, activation of H receptor can enhance the regulatory T cells while at the same time suppressing the inflammation or su suppressing the inflammatory T cells. Um, so, showing you some of the sample. And this is um, um, uh, basically looking at the micro profile of various receptor ligands. Um, and, you know, the resveratrol is over here compared to dioxin and C. And you can see that these, these ligands for H seems to induce a wide range of interaction of uh, micro which are known to be in the gene expression as well. So we've been focusing on certain microRNA, such as uh, 197490, seem to be down-regulated H receptor activation, and these micro specifically target the FOXP3 gene associated with the function of the regulatory T cells. So therefore, that might be the reason why FOXP3 increases. In contrast, certain microRNA they seem to be up-regulated or in Exposed to receptor ligands, these seem to 
therefore lead to domination or decrease in the IL-17. So to wrap this up, uh, what we have shown is that not only the H receptor lines can cause induction of heptones, as we have shown previously, but also they can regulate the, uh, the TX and TX-17 cells, which are in how we maintain our immune system so that we don't mount an autoimmune disease or we don't mount an autoimmune attack and called as epigenetic path. So receptor activation leads to upregulation of certain microRNA, downregulation of certain microRNA, which leads to Fox P3 that, that is essential for the activation of these cells or regulatory T cells that suppress the inflammation. But at the same time, um, it also causes increased expression microRNA that leads to down regulation of TH17 and T and TH17 cells are reciprocally reciprocal so therefore in T regs can cause suppression of TH17 so these are inflammatory cells, these are anti-inflammatory and that's how it protects us from developing inflammation in disease and also that um, methyl profiles it promotes demethylation of P3 and activation of IL-17 also leads to expression of Tregs and expression of TS. So, in summary, for um, to sum up the entire talk, the crude plant extracts are a double-edged sword. Particularly, as I was telling you, um, in Chinese medicines as well as you know Ayurvedic medicines, uh, often we use uh, plant and sometimes these extracts have very complex mixtures of chemicals and sometimes they are contaminated with pesticides, sulfides, uh, heavy metals and so on. So sometimes for this can cause severe toxic effects and therefore uh, though they are widely used as complementary and alternative medicines, uh, sometimes also not only mediate the toxicity but they can also interfere with the uh, liver enzymes thereby cause uh, thereby interfering with the, the conventional drug as well. So therefore, it is important to perform randomized controlled human trials to see the uh, benefits as well as the risks. And those are some of the studies that are ongoing. The second part of my talk I talked about the natural receptor ligands. So these uh, plant products, the vegetable foods, uh, seem to have natural HR ligands to understand basically how these natural ligands can serve as new therapies to treat inflammatory diseases. And we are using these natural products to develop better animals which are easily available and can stay in the system for a long time so that we can use them as anti-inflammatory agents. Uh, the mechanism they induce is they induce ketosis in activated T cells as they promote um, regulatory T cells while suppressing the inflammatory TH1 and TH17. Now, HR may also induce um, a lot of their effects through binding through the element or xenobiotic response element as well as through activation of epigenetic path. And last, in 2010, the total sales of the pharmaceutical market was estimated to $600 billion, and it is believed that it could to almost one trillion dollar by 2013, and but it's HR ligands, so therefore I believe can offer no opportunities to discover new anti-inflammatory. And again, um, as before, the reason why we are trying to focus on inflammation is because we believe that currently almost all clinical disorders are in some way linked to chronic inflammation. If you find a drug prevent chronic inflammation, it's going to have a huge impact on uh, global health. I just want to acknowledge uh, all the people working at our center, Dr. Mitzi Nagakari, who's director of the center, and all um, the junior, senior faculty who are working in our lab, as well as a large number of graduate students. And I want to acknowledge also the various funding agencies, which have been very supportive of research. With that, I finish my talk and uh, I'll be happy to 
answer any questions. Yes, so the question is um, an question whether the endogenous HR ligands that are found in our body. Um, yes, we've been able to identify certain HR ligands in our system. Um, they've been to be in very, very low context. Um, so for several decades, you know, nobody knew whether there, were, there was any HR ligand. People thought that, you know, HR receptor is there just to prevent us you know, getting exposed to various toxic chemicals that try to detoxify chemicals. So they thought that the entire H receptor was associated with uh, trying to break down toxic chemicals. But it was only more recently um, they discovered that there are potentially endogenous ligands for HR. And for mice, in HR, some abnormalities development of blood vessels as well as liver functions as now importantly they've shown that um, mice have major defects in their immune response because the endogenous HR receptor ligands can bind to the H receptor and activate H receptor thereby preventing excess response so therefore no H receptor if there is no H receptor ligand then the immune system can go haywire and then develop colitis and so many other uh, different diseases. Can you induce endogenous AHR ligands and you get the same response? That's a, that's a great question. So is there any way to uh, induce endogenous AHR ligands instead of direct uh, directly injecting external AHR ligands. Uh, so far, nobody has been able to um, identify mechanisms that could trigger uh, production of you know, endogenous uh, uh, AHR ligands. But having said that, we have worked in other models, for example, cannabinoid receptors. We have endogenous mice and we, they activate cannabinoid receptors that trigger inflammation. Now, this cannabinoid rapidly broken down by certain enzymes. And we are able to block enzymes, there are levels of endocannabinoids, thereby you know, facilitating the anti-inflammation or anti-inflammatory properties. So we are able to do that in the cannabinoid receptor system and receptor ligand system, but we are not so far been able to do that with the with AHR receptor ligand system because we don't know much about AHR ligands right now because um, identification of those ligands itself was very difficult because they are found in new quantities as well. Hello. Yeah. Uh, Professor Prakash, it's very extensive, a lot of starting, have a lot of correlation with the cancer as well, uh, chronic implant. I have a lot of questions for you. One, like, uh, we have a multiple sclerosis, it already chronic stress. So me, uh, do you have any data which indicate when you treat these mice at chronic stress, what's the status may go down, it's reoccurrence, or what the is in the model? Right. That, that's the question, I guess, like, you know, respiratory or indoles and all that. You can completely, in fact, uh, this talk is going to show that if you use the mice to indoles, like what are found in broccoli and crucifix vegetables, you can 100% block the of multiple sclerosis in mice. It was just amazing. Um, when we tried that of the disease, they were effective, but they were not as effective as, you know, pretreatment. And the reason for that is, I think, for most of these autoimmune diseases, um, they are, you prevent them by activation of the T cells. Right. And you have endogenous regulatory T cells, which are, you know, positive, CD25 positive. And we see that activation of H can induce higher levels of regulatory T cells. So, therefore, if you're constantly taking these endogenous H ligands or eating all the vegetables and fruits, you have higher levels of 
proprietary T cells that might prevent us from developing autoimmune disease. But once we develop autoimmune disease, we know that the regulatory T cells are not that effective in preventing the Th1 cells or Th17 cells. So that's why once occurred on that they are active, they are able to reduce the symptoms but they are able to wipe out completely and that's true with the ARDS model other some of the severe inflammatory models we found that our exposure to STB in you know, 24 to 48 of tremendous ARDS with you know cytokine storm if you give even within up to four hours after exposure to SCB, you can prevent significantly lung injury or lung damage. I feel it's significant still because if somebody has been brought to the hospital with the ARDS, they can immediately give within a matter of, you know, two or three hours, if they can be hospitalized, be given, it will be effective because otherwise there is no treatment. 50% of these patients die uh, from acute ARDS. But... Um, that's a, that's a great question, and I think we have to see how we can fine-tune to make the regular T cells still function after the onset of uh, infection. Yes, sir. Right. Very well characterized. I, have, I don't have a slide, but yes. Um, you know, these are all polyphenols. Antidote polyphenols. Actually, they are very similar um, in, in, in terms of ability to activate and to H receptor. But they show some of these compounds compared to these compounds that we are testing in, which are naturally found in vegetables. Um, but one of the compounds we tested is what is it's called FITSI, and that also seems to have very high binding for H receptor similar to dioxin and that also seems to cause toxicity just the way dioxin is. So the structure activity report done um, with, with respect to the affinity binding towards H receptor. Any other questions? Excuse me, yes, sir. sir. There's a microphone. Based on your uh, presentation and it starts with vitamins and the mineral and can uh, brought for, for medicine, uh, what it takes to get regulated, and how is evolution in this uh, field? And, uh, what do you think is the future of, of getting this uh, uh, to the market? Good adjustment and those from those from for me right for the take of good health. And... Yeah, that's that's a question. So, uh, you know some compounds from these plant that's resveratrol or cannabinoids or whatever type of chemical they are considered as and, 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 and because of that um, the moment they are dietary supplements the FDA regulate them I market right now you know all that is extracted from or you know grape skins or seeds and I can do that and you know people are there to buy or just like Ayurvedic or whatever however if there is some toxic somebody dies you know immediately FDA looks into saying okay what happened and they may ban or they may get and ban those those type of compounds but having said that um, once you identify a compound from a rare plant, let's say there's a plant and you isolated, we isolated for example one uh, compound from, you know, a Chinese uh, medicine plant and you can patent that and then, you know, you can make a lot of it and if you want to use that as a drug to treat, you know, patients, then we have to go through clinical toxicity testing, that regular thing and then the FDA comes in so that time the FDA has to to make sure it can be it, it can be marked. Therefore, when we convert these uh, um, botanicals into, we are serious about making them into drugs or using resveratrol as a key molecule, trying to synthesize certain analogs 
and using those as drugs, that is when, you know, we need permission from the FDA. So it's, it's a, a very gray area as to how we can market this is that. And a lot of people have used um, the fact that, you know, red wine has, you know, resveratrol, and because of that, you know, French people are more resistant to their developing cardiac disease despite taking uh, having a diet which is very rich, uh, you know, fat. Um, and this was aired in the news media and people started buying and selling, you know, resveratrol like crazy. So, but nobody really knows um, clinically whether it's going to be useful or not unless somebody has clinical trials. So those are some of the issues that uh, you always have to deal with. And the other thing is resveratrol that is uh, by one company uh, may have only 60 purity and person might have you know 100 percent purity but nobody knows that it's left to the consumers to find out or whatever and it's what makes it very difficult once it's approved by FDA then you know it has to have standards yeah. yes Uh, per kilo body weight of mouse. And we find that converted to human, it comes to about 500 milligrams. And in the United States, you can get uh, over 500 milligrams of resveratrol. Uh, we try to administer that in, uh, in mix it with water and administer that orally uh, into mice. It's a water soluble. Uh, not soluble, but what we um, we we fill suspend in water, and inject or uh, gawage it the entire one, gawage it. We provide it in drinking water. Um, so, what is the delivery of that uh, formulation? You are in a dispatched machines you are giving. What is the way? Of, what is the route of the administration of the drug? Route is oral. So, let's say we we take 0.2 ml, which has got milligrams of we mix it we suspend it rather in water the administrative garage in mice so that all of that is received by the mice not suspend it in water and provide it in the form of a, a drinking water because the compound may sediment or they may not get because it's not water soluble getting toxicity um, toxicity they have done, um, you know, in mouse and rats, there are no grams, there is no toxicity. Uh, humans, um, as I was telling you, the equivalent dose is about milligrams. Given up to, you know, four to five grams of resveratrol, and they find that it doesn't have severe doses. So, as far as toxicity is concerned, our doses are very low. And we find that it's absolutely no, it's just absolutely not toxic. Right. No. Thank you. Yeah, my question is uh, translating the study to humans. How do we prevent the T generating? Because most of the um, all the we have are rats and mouse, not really translate to humans. Concentration could be beneficial to rats, whereas lower concentration could be harmful to humans. Prevent that. Right. Uh, so we are trying to do clinical trials as well with MS patients uh, based on our data that we generated uh, in the mouse. And we have, the FDA has uh, a way to put the mouse dose based on the surface area, you know, uh, from the mouse or rat humans. Um, so we try to calculate that, use that in the, the clinical trials. So we have currently an ongoing clinical trial with uh, multiple sclerosis patients. The only thing, is, the problem with that study is that we can stop um, currently whatever treatment we're taking because, you know, the patients would not want to stop whatever they're taking. But what we're trying to do is whether we can resveratrol the current medication, see whether that could block or further enhance the prevention or onset of symptoms with MS. Um, that's we are, we are trying to deal with that right now. Okay, questions? Okay, a lot of you are for lunch break. Is that lunch break now or one more? Okay, thank you very much.